So just to get started, um, uh, welcome to our session. Uh, my name is Sean Parson. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm a member of the event organizing team and the moderator for the session. I want to make you aware that closed captioning is available. To view a live transcription, click the live transcript button on the bottom menu and select show subtitle. Also, in order to secure this space, you cannot rename yourself once you've entered. We are sorry if you are unable to add your pronouns to your name already, but we urge you to do so before logging into the next session. Um, so I am pleased to introduce Dr. Joy James. Uh, they are an activist who tries their hardest to be faithful as an activist as well. And I'm gonna open the floor for you now. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the organizers of this event. Um, thank you for all of those participating in, speaking in it, um, witnessing it and dialoguing about it. I think the notion of imagining abolitionism or abolition is incredibly central, but also very complicated and contradictory. So I'm going to try, because I'm hoping this is gonna be more of a conversation and my students might be on, so feel free to jump in if you have questions or statements that you would like to share um, from our studies collectively on black Marxism. I think this whole attempt to define war, to confront war and to one day abolish war is always reflecting the agency of the collective. And then it would be the collective who has the greatest proximity to war zone or lives into a, in a war zone per se. So here we go. Before the next uprising, subtitle Return to the Source, Amilcar Cabral's relevance to contemporary family, cadre and nation as sites of war. The title, the primary title before the next uprising comes from Rebecca Ann Wilcox, who is a theorist, ethicist, activist, and who's introduced me in the last number of weeks to certain forms of organizing activism shaped around the families who've lost loved ones to police violence. So before the next uprising, my argument here is we need to return the, to the source and that Cabral points the way. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about his work, Return to the Source. I wanna share four quotes, four quotes for meditation and reflection, which become hopefully catalyst or at least cocoons for the first steps of breaking out into political acts. The first is from the prophet Muhammad. What actions are most excellent? To gladden the heart of a human being to feed the hungry, to help the afflicted, to lighten the sorrow of the sorrowful, and to remove the wrongs of the injured. The second quote is from Miss Fanny Lou Hamer. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The third quote is from Fred Hampton. Let me just say, peace to you, if you're willing to fight for it. And the last quote is from Amilcar Cabral. Culture is simultaneously the fruit of a people's history and a determinant of history by the positive or negative influence which it exerts on the evolution of relationships between man, woman, and his environment among people or groups of people within a society as well as among different societies. It's again, Amilcar Cabral, Return to the Source. On this day in 1865, John Wilkes Booth, a Confederate sympathizer and a white supremacist, shot and killed Abraham Lincoln. Historians assert that it was Lincoln's intent to grant voting rights to Black Union soldiers that sparked Booth's assassination by a single shot to the head of the president while he watched a performance at Ford Theater in Washington, DC. The Civil War was fought on all types of battlefields. Vice President Andrew Johnson, a Tennessee enslaver, became the next president nearing the end of the war in which some 200,000 people of African descent fought for their freedom. So a war of liberation would not be a war that we avoid and a war of liberation 
is essential in order to attain our freedom. That freedom though would be derailed, denied and decentered through the 13th amendment, which codifies enslavement. I think we all know as abolitionists, um, if one has been duly convicted of crime, right? And the 14th amendment, which over decades, the Supreme Court repurposed from being the agency for political personhood for the emancipated to being the vehicle for the accumulation of corporations, meaning citizens versus United, that corporations in the United States have political personhood and their ability to influence elections through largely unlimited spending, right? Shapes the trajectory of the democracy. Back to Lincoln. Lincoln was no white savior. So I echo what Fred Hampton, Cabral, Fannie Lou Hamer and others have asserted that the people free themselves. So Lincoln, without the halo of the white server, focused largely on the reunification of a white supremacist republic. This suggests that our wars are never ending. And the question is, how do we shape a trajectory that would lead to some sort of material victory? His successor, meaning Andrew Johnson, was a bit of a nightmare, you know, in stark comparison to the dreamy halo that Lincoln also um, seems to wear in conventional history and conventional academic instruction. Johnson worked to restore the political, legal, economic standing of the Confederate States and worked diligently to strip protections from the emancipated. Thus he allowed the wars to continue but largely now not against white brethren in the South, against white brethren in the North, but the wars would continue as structured predation against blacks, indigenous and their anti-racist allies. And again, this is complicated in our attempts to abolish war and allyship, right? Blacks, anti-racist white allies or people of color indigenous people, all are shaped in some ways by this non-ending war against blackness, this non-ending war steeped, not in just national predation against black bodies, but global predation. As Cedric Robinson, Eric Williams, Walter Rodney, all have argued in their academic texts, and I would say Walter Rodney in his life and in fact, sacrificing his life to argue through embodied activism. The enslavement of Africans, people of African descent, organized terror as war against people of African descent, jump-started capitalism. So the racial capitalism that we inherit is tied to the dispossession and disposability of people around the globe but there's a specificity in the war against black people, against people of African descent, does not, uh, that specificity at times becomes subsumed under generalities, universalities of people in struggle or coalitions writ large. So in this legacy that we've inherited, right? And this imperial democracy, right? The shining beacon on the hill, the question of what is war, how is it waged over centuries and how one resists it, that for me becomes a primary issue. So in the classroom, we talk about teaching and learning based on the text, that the text in academia is central to instruction about the nature of war, the nature of justice, how we could obtain peace. Again, Fred Hampton echoes in my mind, I wish you peace, to paraphrase Hampton, if you're willing to fight for it. So when you ask me to speak about the abolition of war, I wonder what is your definition of war? How is that definition rooted or abstracted from the condition of black and African struggles? How is it connected to or abstracted from the conditions of the indigenous? And how 
if we seek to reform, renovate, recover, restore democracy, if this democracy has always exhibited predatory desire and predatory violence against those who register or recognized as black, what would we want to salvage out of a war machine? So when I was asking Sharon Onga before we got on, what is it that I'm supposed to be talking about and this large construct of war? They, she pointed me in the direction of international policy or foreign policy. And I would agree in this struggle of abolitionism, right, in order to end war. It is not possible unless we think of ourselves as internationalist, and it is not possible unless we define what is resistance to war and how does resistance to war not look like another form of war. I'm not sure if we can answer the last, I'm not posing it as a riddle, but I would only return to what I am asserting. The democracy we've inherited is an empire. We are more valued as abolitionists if we speak about domestic politics. But the key to understanding how domestic terror can go from coast to coast, through the territories, Puerto Rico, through the other states, right? through the region or the sphere of influence that the US wields, not just in the Americas, but throughout the globe. The only way to comprehend war is to look at it through the international lens and to understand this democracy to be imperial. The question of whether or not we want an imperial democracy seems to me to be addressed in an ethical way in terms of conventional abolitionism but not with the specificity, or at least I've not seen it clearly. So I look forward to you enlightening me, not with the specificity in which we would challenge the state itself. So I wonder if we wish to abolish war by staying out of war, if we wish to abolish war by studying texts by authors who never went to war, or are we willing to abolish war by studying those who fought in war zones and thus have the existential knowledge when they speak of what they speak, which is how to stop war. And here I want to turn then to Cabral. I would say in setting up these brief remarks about Emil Cabral's um, return to the source, that there's a concrete distinction between guerrilla intellectuals and academic intellectuals. And I'm not reading anymore, just having a conversation with you. We've talked about this in class for the last number of months. I don't think we're clear after several months, it may be several years or several decades, but here's my understanding of the distinctions between the two. The academic intellectual has a paid function and that function based on their employment sector, if it's a public university, then I believe technically you're working for the government, the university of name a state, and it is the government or governmental bureaucracy of the state that administers, determines your budget and also polices you within the academy. If you teach in the private sector, as I do, you know, uh, you work for a private corporation, even if it's a nonprofit. And so thus the ethos or the civility or the respectability of that corporation also polices you. And the question becomes, if an academic intellectual has never been a, a war zone, except perhaps as visiting like a wartime correspondent before the report back to their corporate entities, Washington Post, New York Times, right? If you've never been in a war zone as anything other than a visitor, 
how is it that we have the capacity to analyze what would be required to abolish war? And this, I think, is one of the contributions of Marxism, whichever type you're doing. I've been listening and reading lately Frank Chapman's book on Marxism, Leninism, and Black liberation. And the understanding, right, from Marx and before Marx, just from the nature of struggle, that those who live the material conditions of struggle are most informed about how struggle can be waged. Meaning that it is not just your victimization from poverty or incarceration, it is your agency to resist that victimization. And that agency and its most fierce aspects is formed in the zone of struggle, also known as a war zone. So the quotes that I gave you with the exception of the prophet Muhammad's quote, right? Fannie Lou Hamer, Fred Hampton, Amilcar Cabral, they fought Hamer in the Southern Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi, arrested, tortured, sexually violated, survived. Before that, she survived the fields sharecropping, survived the death threats. Hampton did not survive past the age of 21, but left a legacy of analysis and theory in terms of what constitutes a war and how might liberation be waged to free ourselves from those forms of predatory behavior that are baked into war. And Amilcar Cabral, who's assassinated in 1973, after a decade of leading a struggle of liberation in Guinea and Cape Verde, right? His understanding in Return to the Source, which is a collection of his lectures that were given to the people, but also that were inspired by the people. So it wasn't a one-way gift as an academic or intellectual giving back. It was literally a conversation, a dialogue between the mass and between the people who would speak on behalf of the mass in the international arena, meaning US universities, as well as the United Nations. So the academic intellectual is alienated from the war zone, but has the authoritative voice to speak of war. So me included, right? Or at least you asked me to do this. Whereas the guerrilla intellectual is made disposable by his love of people that brings him or her or the engendered into the war zone itself. And on the ground in the war zone, one sees all the complexities and the atrocities and the desires for victory and willingness to sacrifice that are opaque when one is helicoptering over or flying in or flying out or jetting in or jetting out, out of poverty, out of visits to the incarcerated, out of sending books. And again, I am placing myself in the mix of the academic intellectual. I am not claiming to be a guerrilla intellectual. I'm only saying that in order to answer the prompt that you gave me as a title, in order to answer that, you would have to have a proximity to the guerrilla intellectual. And the question is, does anyone in the academic sector who's privileged to have a day job and some modicum of health insurance and benefits. Does anyone want, want to share leadership with those who have survived war or share the memories and intellectual legacy of those who were assassinated during war? The transition of Lincoln I noted as being a historical marker for today, but there have been so many assassinations of black activists, so many killings and murders of black non-activists that to contemplate this query 
is to place oneself in a space of vulnerability, which is a flood of memories of people who should have lived to old age in order to instruct us ourselves, although we are grateful of their writings that remain. And the present day vulnerability of our youth. So Dante's demise over an air freshener supposedly obscuring a rear view, you know, the absurdity, I don't even, I'm not even gonna articulate, right? The specificity of the way we are hunted and killed. That is a war. What do you wanna do about it? I think this becomes a complicated question. Is it sufficient to document an archive the state's predatory employees interactions with us? Or do we have to return to the source? And for Cabral, the source is the people themselves, not the academics, which would be a stratum above the people, elevated by our degrees, elevated by our levels of comfort and affluence, and beyond the academics, this new cadre of intellectuals, which I, do, I can't even fully articulate, but who've managed to be representations of struggle while accumulating or having access to millions of dollars. My understanding is that an empire does not compensate you for overthrowing it. An empire compensates you for quelling rebellions or translating them into performatives or narratives that say there is a war as an abstraction, but not a war as a concrete phenomenon in which there is blood splattered on the concrete, right? Or on your car or in a shopping plaza. So what does Cabral offer? to this dilemma of what happens when the academic intellectual tries to comprehend the guerrilla intellectual, but fears their trajectory because of love of people, what I've written about briefly in truth out as revolutionary love seems to accelerate the shortening of a lifespan. So what can the academic intellectual learn from Cabral? One is the importance of culture and that culture is created on the ground. It is not created through marketing. It is not cooked up in a focus group, whether, whether it comes from Madison Avenue type engineering or whether it comes from nonprofits at their monthly meetings around, I'm assuming it's a round table. So if it comes from the people themselves, like the people most vulnerable to dispossession, to dishonor, to poverty, to bad schools, bad healthcare, less access to immunization, to vaccines, less trust, and the medical apparatus because it's betrayed them or experimented on them, you know, as the Nazis experimented on people in their camps. Doctors have experimented on African American, Indigenous, Latino, Latina in their camps, psychiatric hospitals, medical wards, prisons, jails, ICE detention camps. The so called wound collector has been the most recent that we've heard of. So if Cabral says that culture comes from the ground and we are alienated from the ground, are we willing to consider what Cabral also states? Is that our class status would be something that we would have to give up? That our sense, and I wanna put a qualifier here because I've heard people say that I want people to be poor who are middle class, no, I never said that. I mean, you have a day job. All academics do, and I'm not counting the people who teach in junior colleges. I'm talking about us in 
you know, research one, elite, private, et cetera, et cetera. The point is not that you will be impoverished. The point is whether or not you can be enriched by struggles, rebellions that come from the ground by people most vulnerable to police terror. There is a class dimension that is functioning here. I would happily be corrected if people can show me where the children of wealthy millionaires get caught into this form of violence that comes from police. Police aggression seems to go off the hook. I can't find the correct language if there's better language at the moment. Most likely in neighborhoods that are under-resourced. And so they become, in the minds of the people who live there, war zones or occupation zones. The police then become occupation forces. Connecting again to the international, our problem is not just to the local police, about the local police, the NYPD, the Chicago Police Department that ran a torture ring under John Burge for decades, right? He eventually went to prison, but for a white collar crime. After scores of people, black men, black women, black teenagers, which means black children were tortured in an offsite camp you know, location, a black ops site, like the CIA was known to run to get false confessions. So CFIS in Chicago now is trying to still, after decades, get those people out. But those are examples that I'm still stuck with the question I was trying to raise. Are we willing to defer to the analyses and the demands of the people who create the cultures of resistance? We articulate them when they're codified in a book. We articulate the culture of resistance when we write the book to talk about the rebellion. But we are not the architects of the rebellion. And what happens if Cabral is correct, that the origin of culture is not coming from the bourgeoisie, you know, called middle class, upper middle class, do whatever name feels best for you. But the very culture that creates the possibility of resistance to war in order to abolish war may come from people who do not agree with academic analyses or academic remedies. That culture may not gesture towards policy reform. That culture may not demand greater electoral voting, even though we should have it but that may not be the priority. That culture may demand the undoing of violence by addressing the heart of violence and stopping the heartbeat of empire. And if that's the case, there is no way that we could agree in the ab abolition of war that this current administration, which is definitely better than the previous proto-fascist administration, actually plans to stop war. January 6, as I wrap to close, and more can be said about Cabral, but I suggest you read his text, Return to the Source, the compilation of his writings, his speeches. That compilation was done by academics so I understand the value of academics as auxiliaries, right, and assistant, you know, workers, but not as central leaders. If January 6th demonstrated to all of us that a coup is not the proper way, right, an attempted coup is not the proper response to your disappointment in an election in which voter suppression or the attempt to voters, you know, voter suppress, stop the steal was focused on largely black cities, meaning black voters. If we agree that a coup is not appropriate for the United States, how is it that the Biden-Harris administration can signal that they're okay with a coup in Haiti? If we agree that drone strikes and our neighborhoods or in our cities is an act of terrorism, how can we agree 
that AFRICOM that was begun under George Bush and ramped up under Barack Obama, that AFRICOM destabilizing the African continent is an appropriate expression of foreign policy and statesmanship. If we agree that ICE has manifested as a proto-fascist um, mechanism to terrorize families, how is it as the Black Agenda Report notes in its latest news briefs that Biden and Harris have deported more Haitian people in several weeks than Trump, than the Trump administration did in months, right? Again, I come back to this moment, the moment of international struggle in which the freedom of one nation is dependent on the freedom and the liberation of another, in which violence becomes the mechanism to destroy liberation movements, but is followed by an elite that claims to represent the mass and the culture that they create that now becomes a commodity under capitalism. Meaning as we've stated elsewhere, how is it under capitalism, you can monetize black suffering and black death. And so if we tie the abolition of war as Anga and others have pointed out to the desire to abolish war across the globe, we will be drawn into battle with a democracy that functions as imperial might. And that battle could never be led by academic intellectuals because be, except for the quote exceptional, which I do not mean by that the celebrity, because it, there is no desire in our training to want that kind of struggle, which means to end with Cabral, there would have to be a way that we agreed with our elite accumulations to stand down from leadership. That does not mean that we uncritically defer to anything that comes from the streets or the neighborhoods that are under-resourced and under siege. But that means that we learned and earned hopefully the humility that Cabral expresses. Political theory from liberation, for liberation, comes from the people who wage the struggle under the material conditions of being targeted by the state and dispossessed by the state. It does not come from an upper stratum of the black bourgeoisie, nor does it come from the super stratum of capitalists, funders, donors, corporate influencers, right? That throw millions of dollars at an upper sector, keep billions for themselves, and then try to shape the discourse of what it means to be free and how to wage a war against war. Is that war material in the physicality only? No, there is psychological warfare. There is ideology, there is marketing, there is disciplining for those who do not follow the rules and who seek to follow the source. We turn to the source. It is not an abstraction. It is the material conditions of struggle. Our love for freedom and our tolerance, if we can't manage love for each other, should sustain us for that return. But if there is any hope to abolish war, to undo war, it would be hope that is shaped by the theorizing of those on the ground. It would be the hope and the political will and desire expressed by those who are not living in some form of a gated community, whether it is academia, whether it's a nonprofit corporation, or whether it is the government itself. So I humbly, accept the teachings that I do not fully comprehend. But the four quotes I led with, for me, 
are not just political mandates, they're spiritual guidelines. And it is that spirituality and self-discipline and the willingness to learn from all collectives, but particularly the source of theory that is dedicated to freedom. It is that that gives me hope and optimism for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. James, that was a phenomenal talk. And so we're gonna be moving into the conversation component and we really do want this to be as much of a conversation as possible. Um, so if you would have a question, you can either post the question into the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you to ask a verbal question. Um, the goal is to have as progressive a stack as possible. So I'll do my best, it's hard on Zoom sometimes to be able to pull that off. Um, and I'll be reading some questions from online as well. Um, I apologize, I have dyslexia. So sometimes those questions might, I might make a mistake here or there. Um, but yeah, so please feel free to put your name in if you would like to uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and I'll also read some online. And I was going to open up the first conversation or comment to Sharon, if you would not mind. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity and for your um, great remarks, Dr. James. One of the, I have a couple of questions, but one of the first ones is about political education. Um, how do you feel about political education and reparations um, as ways to keep empire from even recruiting our people into the war machine in the first place? Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I sort of, you were kind enough to ask me what kind of photo I wanted, right? And so then I posted the one of my father. And so I didn't go into it, but I mean, it should be, I thought the image was obvious, right? Um, in order to maintain the status of middle class still during the Jim Crow era in the South, in Texas, uh, cut a deal with the state, right? And so that paid for music lessons and braces. But I'm quite aware like 55,000 US casualties, two to three million Vietnamese, the latter's a genocide. And so I think as a, as a people, right? We were always offered deals, right? you know, do a commercial for like a gas guzzling vehicle or something, or like come sing this song or like put out this book or star in this movie. We're always offered deals as an entry level, right? With the promise of more. So if you accumulate, then you're supposed to have security. The, the fact of the matter, even though I said there's a class differential who tends to be brutalized by cops on the streets or on the subways, right? There is no such thing as security for people of African descent in an anti-Black world. So I don't care how you feel about the Afro-pessimists, go ahead and read them because at least they gave you an alphabet. So we you know, form a language that we can talk about it and then you can tell me what their limitations are but you can't tell me there are no contributions there. Like if you're gonna criticize them for the contributions of pointing to the specificity of anti-Black animus as a global phenomenon, then we can't have a conversation because it's not in good faith. So if we're continuously purchased and we were people who were reduced to commodities that could be bought and sold and traded, then a 21st century sophisticated trade in blackness still has its origins in terror and still produces the outcome. Reparations, I would say yes, but then back to what you pointed to in terms of international template. And I think this is what we've been reading from Eric Williams, Walter Rodney, who I think went way beyond Eric Williams, right? Ideologically, Cabral, Malcolm, others, right? Um, the descendants of the, the so-called Mau Mau should get reparations too, because the British tortured them, made them build infrastructure like um, airports and castrated, I mean, if you rebel, it is surplus torture. There is the everyday torture and death of black civilians. And there is a surplus torture of black combatants. And they could be pacifists. Like King was a pacifist. That wasn't gonna stop an assassination. I start with Lincoln, knowing that he was compromised and kind of was trying to figure out where can we deport these people to after we accumulated wealth from enslaving them. But the people in our lineage, our memory, our collective DNA are very complicated 
and we have contradictions. If we want reparations, it is not sufficient to ask for them solely within the framework of US capital because US capital accrued as an international phenomenon that the Europeans started when they were accruing like for 500 plus years. So the Mau Mau would need reparations. Haiti would need reparations. They free themselves and you, you literally torture, massacre, but they still free themselves. And sorry about the trigger, but we're talking about war. And then you demand that you get reparations as the French. They have to pay you for every body that they freed through torture and battle and love. So there's no way and nowhere there is not a black tax imposed upon us. Even the indigenous in this continent, they're indigenous in Africa, indigenous in Australia, but I'm talking here, were offered a kind of deal for the civilized nations. If you agree to enslave or traffic in Africans, we will give you a certain status where you can accumulate land and wealth. So, all right. So if, if you wanna codify us this way, we will ask for everything. And what we will ask for is what you cannot provide without your own collapse. And this I learned from the mothers who had lost children. Again, international, not just in the States, but in Brazil and Colombia when I would travel and meet them. And the mothers in Chicago, Dorothy Holmes, Chappelle Wells, who lost their sons to Chicago police violence. I learned a lot from them, you know, both working in the US and working abroad. But internationally and in the States, those mothers and fathers, when asked, do you want, you know, not all of them, but some, and I'm not saying what kind of choices you need to make. I'm simply as an academic chronicling my memory. When offered certain things, they would say, no, bring back the child you murdered. That is because if the state and empire wishes to act like a God that can take life, it should function like a God and resurrect life. If it cannot, then it is not a God. It is not Pharaoh. And its laws are not legitimate when they're predatory. This is what I think Cabral is talking about. When you stop deifying your predator, when you can conquer your fear of your predator and move in formation, then you demand what they cannot offer. And in this case, for the collective, it is not the return of our slain. We will mourn them, grieve them, remember them as best we can. It is our liberation. The state will not free you. It cannot without dissolving itself. It never decided it was gonna self-immolate. So then all these layers, these stratum of like, I'm here to help you or advocate for you. It's just like, I think if you go to Cabral, return to the source. The resources, if we need life, and we do, then we need to counter the predator in all of its formations and articulations. And that is an international struggle. You have to ask from your, and this is gonna be a trigger for some. Okay, so when I was training, I just paused this sentence to try to get as real as I could. When I was training my 20s in a women's dojo in Brooklyn, like Brooklyn Women's Martial Arts, like we were deployed to do security for different things. We were told to go to the Central Park case. We got into the trial. We realized like, you know, the youth were innocent. We mobilized as best we could. But we were also told as we were trained, like to do these different forms of security, self-defense, that in trigger warning, sexual violence, that if you, if you wanted to survive your rapists, you, maybe you don't fight them. I don't think we had a consensus on that, right? And so like, if you amplify this from the personal assault to the collective assault, are we allowed to fight those who prey upon us? And does that include the state itself and also the people who are happy to help you fit into the state when it will not accommodate your freedom? Cabral says yes. As an academic, I'm reticent to say anything. 
but I actually know what I'm going to actually do, no matter what I say or don't say. So it's got to be international to repeat. It's got to follow the people who have the least possessions and so the most to lose, but also the most to gain if they get their demands met. And what we're owed is not just political economies. We're owed our culture. And that culture is heavily invested and formed on resistance and survival and a certain kind of beauty and spirituality that cannot be replicated in simulacra or in commercials. Great. Um, Sharon, do you have another question? Okay, great. I was going to read one of the questions um, that were posted online. Um, this comes from an anonymous attendee. Um, and the question is, uh, the concept of nationality and nationhood that was for the most part imposed by colonials and imperialist forces um, in, by uh, promote arbitrary borders. A lot of indigenous and colonized people have erased and some are still fighting for self-determination. How is the abolition of borders or rather the formation of a transnational alliance integral to abolishing war? Not just on a micro scale, but on a macro scale. Sure, I mean, it's a great question. Again, I'm, I'm wondering what the, I support it, but the mechanism becomes how. And also, what does it mean as long as, you know, racial capitalism or imperialism are functional? So the borders are open, but accumulation continues. I was looking at some of the emails I received that there was it 35 new prisons being built in Egypt, right? Because the, the standard that the U.S. has established as one of the greatest carceral states, right, um, is exported. And also since our foreign policy is funding, I would say it's funding the Israeli occupation of Palestine, it's funding AFRICOM, it's destabilizing, you know, we could just go, go, what's going on in Yemen? I mean, just go anywhere in the globe and, and track the money. War Resisters League has off offered, or yeah, offered, and analysis is one of its latest publications because we're those of us who have jobs and have accumulated something, we're going to pay taxes soon. That, you know, 80%, not counting Social Security and, and those, the trust funds, you know, monies, but 80% of what we're going to be taxed is going to go to the Pentagon. So, you know, it's going to militarism. So you can, you can open the borders. And you can get private armies like Eric Prince, or you can infiltrate borders, or you can cross borders. The ability to control your territory is going to be shaped by your ability to deal with militarization and the concentration of capital with billionaire donors to the Democratic and Republican parties. So in the domestic poli politics, you can say, oh, the Democrats are like, they're not racist, they're not homophobic, da, da, da. That's that other party. Okay, I get it. But when you look at foreign policy, I'm like, wait, like who's the good guy and who's the bad guy here? Because there seems to be a lot of rhetorical posturing about human rights, but not a ramping down of militarization. Black Alliance for Peace raises questions. Will Biden really pull us out of Afghanistan after 20 years of, of bogus war and terror that Condoleezza Rice along with Colin Powell. I mean, these are black people, so I'm not like black people are the way to the future, right? But there was a multiracial effort to convince the public to engage in an interventionist war that's probably tr cost trillions. So open the borders but this last note, I mean, also expect the white supremacist terrorists to just have a field day because we never secured the terms of violence. Our aspiration for human rights, this is Cabral talks about that in his book. He goes to the human rights. He said, we went to the United Nations for human rights in the United. He said, we were naive. That's really not what they do. And the international community might not. <laughs> have that as their job description either, to give material support in concrete ways that diminishes the capacity to violate and terrorize people. Everywhere there is a war zone, open the borders, you still have the war zones. 
you have to address the source of the violence. And that is a dangerous endeavor. Great, thank you. Um, next, we're gonna be calling on um, Carlin. I was hoping um, the Zoom masters could unmute them and allow them to ask a question or uh, kind of have a comment that I think will also kind of spur some questioning. Uh, yes, Dr. James. Uh, I was, I don't know if it's fortunate. I was, I was in a class with uh, Dr. Wilderson and Dr. Sexton yeah. and man, it must've been, it was a while, 20, Frank was just back from South Africa. Yeah, over 20 years ago then, right? Yeah. And uh, it was very interesting. It was, uh, they just had taken the Pell Grants away in the 90s. I think that was Clinton. I'm sure it was Clinton because he was so good at that kind of stuff. <laughs> and someone from UC Davis, what was her name? Oh, it doesn't matter. Start, you know, started a, somehow got some money together somehow and started a school in the, in San Quentin. And we had some pretty interesting instructors as soon as they first came in. Dylan Rodriguez and Frank Wilderson and Jared. Yeah, and Jared Sexton and uh, uh, Parenti's kid. What was his name? Uh, anyhow, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they did exactly what you're, I mean, I don't know exactly what you're saying, but they asked us what we wanted education to look like or what we wanted the world to look like. And knowing that we didn't have the code or the language to discuss it actually. I mean, it, it just, uh, it just wasn't there. But on the yard, we had our own code and it was sufficient for us to develop ideas about injustice or or what what is really going on with war or but that kind of discussion would never make it to uh academia or the corporations or whoever's deciding that's like a weird whoever's deciding <laughs> you know uh so how to make change and now that i'm in academia and try to, trying to get an advanced degree, it's an emotional struggle to, because to, I'm in with a bunch of students that are, I'm in a group, an outfit that's, a, that's formerly incarcerated or system impacted. And it's still the same struggle. It's like 25 years on maybe. And the code is still so, I mean, I guess it's like mother's milk. You're just born with it. Until I get beyond it, it's like, I mean, the, I'm so much, I'm almost 80. So I'm, I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff and I can think about stuff I've seen from World War II even. But the younger, younger uh, formerly incarcerated and system impacted, there's, I, mean, I don't know what it, what's the right word. They're, uh, they think that the ac academia has the answer. I mean, because that's what they've been taught, right? And you're, and you're only, yeah, of course. yeah. And I tell them, no, you got the answer. I mean, you gotta, you know, it's not a matter of getting a degree. I mean, that's good. That's all good because I know they've been their their first time, first, what is it, first generation ever in school or whatever they call that kind of stuff. And I mean, but it's so it's so just part of our being mm -hmm. that I mean, but we have the answer. Well, we might not, we might not have the answer, but we got a different way of looking at stuff. You have you have theory. I mean, if I recall correctly, Jared and Frank got kicked out of teaching inside because they were following you all. Like they they asked you what you thought, and because your thought had content and relevance, and had power, um, they were kicked out. So you know, this is what I'm I'm trying to figure out. What's how do we sustain the conversations with each other, right? without letting the academy or the prison, it's kind of weird if the academy and the prison start functioning in similar disciplinary modes, right? Without them silencing 
those conversations and discussions. I mean, for me, Cabral just sees this synergy. Some people would call it a dialectic. Like Carlin, you speak, and then I'm like, okay, well, what about this? And then we go back and forth and that we collectively work together. But if I try to take your story and you know package it, and then I become the official spokesperson for you, that is a form of extraction. I mean, that's basically what I've been arguing, right? And I've tried not to do it. I'm not saying that I've never done it, but I've tried to be mindful of how this, we're structured to do that, right? So I spent eight years anthologizing political prisoners who were rebels. So they fought wars and technically, yeah, you would say it was a defeat. But then on another level, people are still reading them decades after their demise or if they just got out of prison last year after 49 years, right? Because they're relevant. So Cabral says, you all have theory and he's right. The question is, how do we access that theory if we believe only that academia delivers real education? But thank you. Yeah, we only have about three minutes left, so there's not much time, but um, there's one other question um, from the chat that I think could be a good one to end with. Um, um, and that is um, uh, from Amy Schuster. Um, and, and they write, I think, uh, thank you so much for the distinction between academic intellectuals and guerrilla intellectuals. I think about how the race and ethnicity of the intellectual in question does and does not permit inhabiting the position of both. I think of the cases of Stephen Salata and also Mark Lamont Hill's censorship mm -hmm. by the trustees of Temple University. What do you think can be done to help protect the availability of these positions? Thank you for that question. Okay, I should have said the concept of guerrilla intellectuals comes from Walter Rodney. He was an academic and then went back. I mean, he had, he was teaching in Africa. He was awarded, um, it's guy and I said my brain is a little fried today. A position he was later again. This is the day of remembering assassinated leaders. He was assassinated by car bomb. But the guerrilla intellectual for me is is linked in a way to Cabral's intellectual. And yes, what happened to the other um, academics, particularly in their assertion of support for Palestinian autonomy. Um, was an act of violence exercised by, you know, academia because they get to discipline supposedly what they pay for, which means it's a purchase in, in some ways. It's a transactional purchase. I don't think the academy is really, it's definitely not geared to the liberation of our people. I'm not sure how much it's geared to theory itself as a quote science that you could pursue to the logic of thinking which would mean you would advocate for, you know, Palestinian, you know, indigenous liberation around the world, right? Um, I think, yes, we should protect academics who get victimized. I mean, personally, I've like loaned money for people like, you know, lawyer up, see what you can do. We sign and write petitions. And I think that's important. I also though want to keep this distinction this is a privileged caste, right? This is not someone who is unhoused and sleeping in the subway in New York City. This is not somebody who is in Attica. This is the 50th anniversary of the Attica rebellion and the way the state responded to a human rights advocacy as a, as a declaration of war. And so shot through white guards to kill black rebels, right? So if we maintain the distinctions of our precarity and vulnerability, and then organize across those distinctions and the academics, there should be enough progressive academics to create a safety net for people who are sort of pushed out a window of the academy. And this is not just the faculty, it's also graduate students who are told you can't like study Afro-pessimism or you can't cite this person in your dissertation or I won't write you a letter or I won't, you know, for you to get a job or I won't sit in your committee. So this is psychological warfare that I was talking about. There's a difference between psychological warfare 
and the material physical warfare. They are joined together because ideologi ideologically you have to beat people up in terms of their ideas of liberation to make sure they don't join an insurrection. But it is still not the same thing. It is not the same war zone. <clears throat> to the extent I think that we would ally is when it's not just academics signing these petitions of reinstating faculty, it's the neighborhood themselves, right? And it's not just the neighborhood themselves who bear the brunt of police violence. It's the middle class, the bourgeoisie as well. When we share precarity, we share material conditions. We develop consciousness with a synergy or interaction. And I think that's the closest we get to accountability. And that's the greatest distance we can have from betrayal. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Joy James. And thank you everyone who's been involved in putting together this conference, this panel. Uh, thank you so much, Jaron Gilchrist for your amazing ASL work. And also um, everyone who's in attendance, if you can, please fill out the feedback form. Um, and go on to the next panel. But thank you so much for this panel. Um, it's been a great conversation. Thank you for sponsoring this event. I look forward to watching the rest of it. Take care. <laughs>